Hello, everyone, and welcome to the FinDev Gateway webinar, Microfinance and COVID-19 in Pakistan, What Happens After Lockdown? My name is Abby Augusta. I'm an editor for FinDev Gateway, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar. Our series of FinDev webinars allow financial inclusion practitioners like you to share lessons and attend online presentations and discussions delivered by the world's leading financial inclusion experts. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of notes on logistics. First of all, attendee microphones will remain muted during the presentations. All attendees have their microphones muted automatically. So in order to ask questions during the webinar, please use the chat box, which is on the right-hand side of the WebEx window. We invite you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar presentation, and we will address them in the Q&A session at the end. In order to make sure your question is seen by the moderator, select all participants from the drop-down menu when sending in your questions. We have almost 500 people registered for this webinar, and so we may not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will share the IPA contact information at the end so that you can also follow up with them if your question remains unanswered. And finally, the webinar recording and presentation will be available on the FinDev Gateway website after the webinar is finished, and we will also email the webinar recording to all participants. And now I will hand the presentation over to Rebecca Rouse of IPA to introduce today's webinar and our speakers. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, and, and good morning and, and good evening to everyone who's joining us. Um, I want to give a big thanks to FinDev Gateway for co-hosting this webinar with Innovations for Poverty Action. Um, and uh, for facilitating what I think is a timely discussion of the results from a recent study in Pakistan, um, work that was supported by IPA through its Financial Services for the Poor initiative. Um, we'll have three speakers today. Um, I will quickly introduce them. Um, first, uh, Mohammed Meki, who's an assistant professor at the University of Oxford, the researcher in development economics at the University of Oxford, where he holds a joint position between the Department of International Development and the Center for Islamic Studies. Um, we also have Farah Saeed, who's an assistant, assistant professor at the Lahore School of Economics and also a research fellow at the Center for Research in Economics and Business. Um, and finally, Timothy Ogden, um, the managing director of the Financial Access Initiative at New York University a research initiative exploring how financial services can better meet the needs and improve the lives of poor households. So thank you all for joining. Um, oops, wrong way. Great. So just quickly, um, so my name is Rebecca. I'm the Director of Financial Inclusion at Innovations for Poverty Action. We're a global nonprofit research and policy organization that works to discover what works to reduce poverty. Um, just very quickly, we have a global presence, um, offices in 22 countries. We work across eight program areas, including financial inclusion, but also covering topics such as agriculture, education, governance, and health. Um, we work directly with partners, uh, such as governments, financial institutions, uh, and other um, uh, development practitioners to uh, investigate what works and generate evidence on how to uh, fight poverty. So we do that through our network of over 600 academic researchers. And we've completed more than 850 evaluations to date. Um, so the, the reason that we're, we're uh, interested in hosting this webinar with FinDev Gateway is because we recently launched a new initiative um, called RECOVER, which stands for Research for Effective COVID-19 Responses. So through this initiative, we've launched rapid uh, response surveys to answer critical policy questions uh, surrounding COVID-19. So this is um, related to financial inclusion and, and financial access and health, but then also covering other topics such as health, um, economic impact, things like that. Um, we have a portfolio of studies that is currently generating rigorous evidence on COVID-19 response strategies, so uh, impact evaluations. And you can find more information about all this work on our global hub that centralizes research and policy lessons from all of, all of this work. So if you visit our website at poverty-action.org, 
you'll find the Recover Hub, um, which has more than 100 projects listed that are currently ongoing and we'll be updating with results there. Um, and I think it's a nice centralized place to access uh, evidence and information about COVID-19 response globally. Um, so I use financial services for the Poor Research Fund. Um, the, the program that I, that I work on um, is currently supporting six active projects on financial inclusion in Ghana, India, Morocco, Nicaragua, Pakistan, and Peru. And so today we're going to be talking about work that's derived from the Pakistan project here. All of these projects obviously had to adapt to new realities as um, the pandemic hit all of our study sites. So we have been working to do things like shift to phone, phone survey work, um, and adapt some of the, the, the interventions that we, um, and the studies that we had been working on prior to the pandemic. So this also presented an interesting opportunity to collect timely data on the impact of COVID-19 on the institutions that we were partnering with, um, the, the clients and beneficiaries we were studying, um, and the, the interventions that we were testing. So that's the, the I guess, the origin of this work that um, Mohammed and um, Farah and Tim will be speaking about shortly. Um, the project that we've been supporting with the with this team of, um, of CIs uh, is based on a, a project on asset-based finance for microenterprises. Um, so this is the work that, that this team has been doing for several years and, um, you know, the place where we really did see an opportunity to quickly collect timely data on um, the impact of, of, of COVID-19 on the financial um, institutions that, that these CIs were working with. Um, so. You know, in Pakistan, the microfinance sector supports 7.3 million low-income Pakistani households with access to financial services. Um, so, you know, leveraging the project that, um, that had been going on already, uh, our co-authors were able to survey 1,000 microfinance clients across three regions one week after the country's lockdown began. Um, so I, I, I won't get into any of the results because that's what we have our, our speakers here for, but um, let me pass it off to Tim, who's one of the co-authors of the COVID survey, um, and I think has a, sits in a, an interesting place uh, in terms of being able to relate the findings from this project to what we're seeing globally. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, my name is Tim Ogden. I'm the Managing Director of the Financial Access Initiative at NYU Wagner. Uh, and my role here is to kick us off and just provide some context for what we're going to be talking about, because we certainly believe that uh, what we are seeing in Pakistan is relevant not just to Pakistan, but relevant globally. And, and this study gives us some insight into how to be thinking about uh, microfinance. Uh, and uh, for those of you who may have come across uh, some of the other things I've been involved in, you know that uh, I have been deeply concerned about uh, what this present crisis means for the future of the modern microfinance movement. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is uh, in relation to interpreting our results in Pakistan. So quickly, uh, some historical perspective. Um, we often have heard in the rhetoric of the modern microfinance movement of, about the innovation of microfinance, the idea of providing financial services to low-income customers. Um, but we need to understand that uh, there's nothing new about providing financial services uh, to low-income customers. Uh, in, in terms of the product that's actually even offered, um, it has a very, very long history. Uh, group liability goes back at least 400 years. Uh, some other forms of, uh, uh, of offering these, these loans in uh, regular increments in the structure goes back possibly thousands of years. Um, the, Institutions that have offered these services, however, uh, have to wrestle with the fact that providing financial services to low-income households is hard and is it's expensive and therefore requires some compromises in the business model. And eventually those compromises come due. And so the history of offering financial services to low-income households uh, is very old, but it also includes uh, frequent failures of the industries of the institutions that serve those customers. Uh, for reasons that are built into the challenges of serving these excluded customers. So what is unique about the modern microfinance movement? And there are some really unique things about the modern microfinance movement. Uh, first and foremost, that is sustainably connecting these institutions that serve low-income customers to outside sources of capital. This is something that many of these prior institutions, what they floundered on was the limitations of their access to capital to the communities that they were serving, and that left them very vulnerable to local shocks often. 
the modern microfinance industry has enabled uh, these institutions providing services to low-income households around the world to tap into uh, capital markets far beyond their the local area. And that has enabled them to scale and to be much more resilient. And secondly, uh, and I want to highlight, uh, the microfinance institutions have integrated themselves into the formal financial systems. Now, of course, this isn't true in every country, but in many countries now, MFIs are part of the financial system. Um, they uh, receive capital from local financial uh, from from local capital providers. Uh, they are regulated in some form as part of the financial system, and uh, you know that is another very new thing in terms of providing uh, uh, services to to low income customers. <clears throat> and matters for how we think about what's happening now. So what is different in the current crisis? Um, the microfinance in industry has survived crises in the past. And when I first began talking about some of these things with, with colleagues, uh, we got a, a lot of pushback initially that people uh, thought we were uh, fear mongering, that we were overstating the challenges. Uh, because you know, microfinance uh, weathered the Asian financial crisis uh, with barely a blip, weathered 2008, the global financial system crisis with uh, uh, almost not even noticing even in places where there have been highly localized uh, uh, deep crises, like in Andhra Pradesh, the Movimiento No Pago in, in Nicaragua, uh, the industry itself uh, hasn't really been seriously affected. And that's because of this, uh, this unique uh, marrying of global capital with local capital that the modern microfinance system has. So in something like the Asian financial crisis where global capital markets seized up, it had very little effect on microcredit customers and so didn't affect the underlying economics of the MFIs, and they could just wait out the global capital crisis. Uh, in the same, similar with 2008, uh, and, and in, in local repayment crises, uh, you know, the global capital markets were still functioning, so the MFIs had the opportunity to recapitalize from the sources that they were receiving uh, capital from. And so as long as any crisis doesn't affect both sides, uh, the, the MFI, the, the modern microfinance movement has been very resilient. But this crisis is different because it is affecting both sides of the ledger simultaneously. Global capital markets are seizing up and becoming much more risk averse and have, you know, from the development perspective, have different priorities than microfinance. They are paying attention to things like uh, healthcare systems and delivery of basic needs, cash assistance. In the meantime, because of lockdowns, because of the effect on economies, uh, repayments have stopped in many, many places, or at least been severely curtailed. And so MFIs are having to confront a, a situation where they have obligations that they can't meet, so they're having to negotiate. But even when they can negotiate sort of a forbearance on their own obligations, but when there's limited cash flow, uh, there's not going to be much opportunity for recapitalization. And the value of an MFI to investors is their ability to channel capital. And so uh, you know, MFIs are caught in this vice grip of having to deal with uh, a lack of inbound cash flow and difficulty making the case for, uh, for uh, increased investment or, or recapitalization. That's why this matters and what we're seeing in Pakistan matters, not just in Pakistan. It's understanding the nuances, the, the contours of what's happening in Pakistan can help shed light on the challenges of MFIs around the world. So what is happening so far? Um, the CGAP uh, has launched a survey called Pulse. Uh, if you are working at an MFI and not participating in the Pulse survey, uh, you can find it by just searching CGAP Pulse. I would strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, this data is really important for us to understand what's happening globally. But uh, in what we're seeing in the results so far from people who are participating, it bears out uh, this, um, these challenges that we, we see and why uh, this is a unique moment. Uh, Rebecca, if you'd move to the next slide. There are uh, just a couple of highlights here from the Pulse Survey, and if you go to the CGAP Pulse Survey hosted by Atlas, you'll be able to look at any of this data, looking at it specifically for various regions, and I encourage you to do that. But you see here just uh, two of the questions, one of which is uh, uh, PAR 30%. Um, and uh, for, for those who are not deeply enmeshed in the microfinance industry, um, it may uh, seem like this is not so bad if uh, the median uh, portfolio at risk after 30 days is just over 6%. But uh, for microfinance, which is dependent on uh, uh, rapid turns of capital, 
so that the, each capital dollar is being uh, lent out several times a year. Um, relatively uh, small changes in repayment rates can have serious consequences uh, for the solvency and liquidity of the MFI. Now, keep in mind, too, that these numbers don't include restructured loans. And the reason, for instance, that the, the uh, South and Southeast Asia Par 30 number is so low is that they have restructured uh, you know, upwards of 20%, sometimes upwards of 40% of their loans. And so uh, under normal circumstances, those loans would be at risk. Um, but they've been deferred uh, from a combination of actions of the MFIs and of regulators. So the PAR 30, just the fact that it's creeping up above 4% in most places, should be of deep concern and doesn't probably reflect the, the, how serious the issue is. I think we've been to see that in that second chart there where you see where uh, MFIs were asked how serious um, is the crisis with 10 being looming disaster and 5 being real stress. And you see the median globally, and I stress that's the median, um, half of the MFIs responding think it's worse than that, is beyond real stress. And, uh, you know, I will say just on, based on my read of the literature of scales like this, we should uh, uh, mentally revise those numbers higher uh, in the way people respond to such surveys. Uh, so I am, in fact, uh, pretty deeply concerned about what's happened. Uh, certainly what we saw in the Pakistan data that we'll, you'll see and you know, what we are seeing sort of continuing as the pandemic evolves. Now, we have some poll questions for you that we'd love to get your take on. Just three simple questions. Uh, one is, what regions of the world do you focus on? And here, I, I, we mean like, wh where do you pay attention? So for me, I would answer this question global uh, because I pay attention to all regions of the world. So we're not interested in where you are as much as what area of the world you pay attention to. Second, uh, how worried are you about the survival of MFIs in the region of concern? Uh, we can't match that one to 10 scale uh, from the CGET Pulse survey. The WebEx only allows for one through five, but uh, you know, we'd love to get your sense of uh, your, your concerns for the industry. Uh, uh, and then finally, are you more or less worried than you were 60 days ago? Uh, we're very interested in, in finding out how perspectives are changing. So that poll is gonna be open uh, while uh, Mohammed and Farah uh, present the results of our uh, of our work in Pakistan, and then uh, I'll be back at the end to sort of wrap up with some thoughts about where we go from here. Uh, Mohammed, pass it over to you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone, for joining, um, and thank you, FinDev and IPA, for organizing. Oh. So, as mentioned uh, by Rebecca, we set out to explore what the immediate impact of uh, the crisis were on micro enterprises and more broadly the microfinance institutions that serve them. And so we conducted uh, rapid response phone surveys with around 1,000 micro enterprises. Half of those were current borrowers, um, regular borrowers we call them, um, and half were uh, graduated borrowers. So Rebecca uh, mentioned the project that we have been working on for a few years now, uh, where we help uh, graduated borrowers, people who had already repaid successfully a couple of loans and wanted to expand their business by purchasing a fixed asset. So, um, so we worked with around 500 of those and 500 regular borrowers. And we conducted phone surveys one week after lockdown to see what was the impact on, on incomes um, and, and, and expenditures. And we also conducted uh, surveys with 200 loan officers, which came from uh, three large microfinance institutions. So those were the, the phone surveys. And at the same time, we wanted to, to speak to the individuals running the uh, microfinance institutions. So we conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with around uh, just under 20 uh, microfinance CEOs. And so these covered um, both types of, uh, broadly both types of uh, microfinance institutions, the non-bank uh, financial companies, uh, the NBFCs, and also the microfinance banks. Um, and as many people will know here, um, the NBFCs are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission, while the microfinance banks are regulated by the central bank, which is the State Bank of Pakistan. Now, Farah will talk a little bit more about uh, the timeline of events and uh, exactly uh, what type of regulatory support was provided. But uh, essentially, both the SECP and the State Bank were very active um, in responding to the crisis and uh, specifically in allowing uh, deferral of loans. And so uh, we wanted really to, to, to investigate what the impact uh, of that policy had been on the borrowers, um, as well as the immediate impact of the, of the crisis. 
Now, uh, focusing uh, first on the micro and uh, micro enterprises, um, we found quite uh, you know quite sharp results in terms of the drop on house for household income. So, uh, comparing the week after lockdown with the week before lockdown, total household income from all sources, primarily business income, uh, had dropped around 90%. Um, and this was across the whole sample. So both the graduated borrowers who are, tend to be a little bit wealthier, um, have larger businesses, have more fixed assets, as well as the regular borrowers. So this was uh, something we saw across the board, a very sharp drop. And of course, when we started the survey, we were really concerned um, about the ability of, of individuals to repay their loans. And that was our uh, primary interest. But what came out of the surveys was that, of course, that clearly was a concern that people had their ability to repay their loans. But the thing that they were even more concerned about was food security, like how do you secure um, the next uh, meal for, your, for you and your family? And so this, this came as a surprise to myself and, and to, to some of us, but not to others who, who I guess, um, were already aware of the fact that many of these uh, individuals, even graduated borrowers, were living quite close to the edge in the sense of not having much in terms of uh, savings um, to, to shield them against this shock. And so this uh, re reported 90% uh, decrease in income week on week. Is, is what the micro enterprises told us themselves. And we thought we'd try and uh, verify that essentially by speaking to the loan officers and have them predict what they thought the impact was on, on the micro enterprises. And essentially they said exactly the same thing, something like 88% drop week on week that they had predicted. So, you know, the micro and the micro finance loan officers were very familiar with, with uh, exactly what the situation was for their micro enterprises. Mm -hmm. And as well as verifying it um, with micro uh, finance loan officers, um, we recently had a webinar with um, the Pakistan Microfinance Network, which is like an apex uh, organization. Um, and also uh, part of that webinar was the State Bank, uh, the Central Bank, and also the Securities Commission. And um, the PMN were reporting results from a survey that they had conducted recently, which finds very similar results, um, as does the survey by Kash, which is a, another large microfinance institution. So unsurprisingly, this, this really sharp drop in income uh, meant that the majority of clients uh, who we interviewed were not really able to, to meet the required payments on their loans. And um, again, to, 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 to verify this or to investigate exactly how bad the crisis would be on the uh, repayment uh, rate of the portfolio for the MFIs, we, we also uh, asked the CEOs that we interviewed, the microfinance CEOs, what they predicted the repayment rate of their portfolio would be in, in April 2020. Um, and so, you know, many of you will be familiar with the fact that repayment rates are close to 100% um, and our average repayment rate uh, among the, 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 the 20 or so MFIs that we interviewed was approximately 98% in February. And so this was predicted to fall to uh, 34% in uh, April. Um, and so um, it could be that this was a little bit too pessimistic. Um, but um, this is what they were predicting at the time. I'm not aware of any data for, for April it, itself. Um, as Tim mentioned, um, the, the CGAP surveys indicate maybe repayment rates that are not that bad, but uh, you have to, as Tim said, you have to take into consideration the fact that many, many of these loans have already been uh, restructured. One of the things that was uh, quite concerning in our, um, in our findings, um, even more, you know, of course, the sharp drop in household income and the fact that many people are quite desperate for, for food, food packages, of course, that was very concerning. But another thing that was slightly more, uh, slightly more subtle was the fact that despite the regulators having permitted uh, microfinance institutions to uh, restructure loans, to, to defer the principal on loans for borrowers, um, and the MFIs, that was their official policy that they were offering this uh, deferral uh, to borrowers. When we actually contacted uh, the borrowers themselves, many, many of them reported that they were not aware at all of this uh, ability to do, defer the payments on their loans. Now, um, this was in April, so maybe that it was just taking time for um, the, the policy to be communicated, but loan officers had reported to us that they were intending um, or they were telling people that, about the ability to, to defer. So the, the, it highlighted to us the potential miscommunication or potential for this information not fil filtering through to, to clients. Um, and, and as I said, recently, uh, the Pakistan Microfinance Network had also conducted a survey. And um, unfortunately, it seems that these very low rates of knowledge about the ability to defer a loan were still, were still uh, uh, present in, in the survey that they conducted. So this is something that um, it, it's quite uh, worrying. And, and I'll come back to the, the point about loan officers uh, soon. 
So finally, um, as I said, uh, as well as surveying uh, micro enterprises and uh, microfinance loan officers, we also um, surveyed uh, microfinance uh, leaders, uh, CEOs of, um, as I said, uh, 20 uh, microfinance institutions, which are basically covering the largest microfinance uh, institutions in Pakistan, both MFBs and NBFCs. And one striking theme um, was heterogeneity. And this, of course, wouldn't come as a surprise to many of uh, those in the audience who are experts on microfinance and are well aware of this heterogeneity in terms of regulation. But it really struck us when we were interviewing uh, the CEOs that m just in terms of purpose, many of them uh, saw themselves quite differently. So some saw themselves as, as essentially like charities or uh, uh, socially minded organizations that were helping people out. And at least what they were saying to us was that, was that profit wasn't a major concern for them. Um, they were mostly interested in social outcomes. And on the other side of the spectrum, um, some of the some of the CEOs that we spoke spoke to were very much for profit. Um, you know, it was almost like you were speaking to someone who was working in a commercial bank or an investment bank. It was really very kind of like efficient. Um, a lot of uh, financial terminology, etc. So, so there was this huge kind of um, heterogeneity in terms of how they actually viewed themselves as institutions. Now, more importantly, in terms of policy. Um, you know, people here will know that there's a heterogeneity in terms of regulation. So the non-bank uh, financial corporations, the NBFCs, many started as uh, NGOs um, and, and often catering to much poorer customers. And they still, on average, tend to cater to, more, to poorer customers. Whereas the microfinance banks, the MSBs, um, uh, take deposits um, and are regulated by the, the central bank, the state bank of Pakistan. And so this, this heterogeneity is really uh, important when it comes to, to policy response and consumer protection. Um, you know, as has been written um, in a variety of reports, it would be naive to think that just because these MBFCs are not taking deposits from, from the general public, that uh, were they to fail or were they to collapse, it wouldn't it wouldn't have serious implications. It may actually be a good thing for borrowers, you know, to have your your, your loan uh, company collapse, uh, and that's very naive, especially when 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 thinking about the, this point of uh, the dynamics between loan officers and and clients. It was reported to us by uh, in a number of our interviews that um, in in previous incidents where MFIs had failed. Um, some loan officers had continued to collect payments from borrowers even when the institution had itself collapsed. And so um, it relates to the point about loan officer incentivization, which is my second point, which is that in, in good times, it can make uh, economic sense. Um, it can make sense from the perspective of incentivizing loan officers to, to, to have some portion of their pay linked to their performance. So many loan officers are paid a non-trivial amount based on the number of loans they disperse, like the, the number of new loans that they disperse, as well as the repayment rate on their portfolio. And, and you can understand why this could be a good policy in good times. But in bad times, when the loan officers themselves are under a lot of pressure, I mean, they're quite poor themselves, their, their own families are under pressure, um, they're often the only person earning money in their household, and this came through um, in, in some of the qualitative work that we did with these loan officers, which we followed up with. Um, many of them felt under pressure and under stress, and, and suddenly a large portion or a non-trivial portion of their income had gone, right, because there were, there were no new loan disbursements, and there was no prospect for repayment on many of the loans that they were collecting. And so it really highlighted to us this um, subtle point about uh, the incentivization of loan officers, which hasn't actually been written about that much. The, the Pakistan Microfinance Network has written about this previously, and there may be others who have written about it, but I haven't actually seen that much written about this, and it's, it's quite an important point. Um, and many people had actually recommended to us that uh, just as one has a uh, credit information bureau, um, something uh, akin to a staff information bureau, where um, the loan officers themselves are, are registered somewhere and, and their previous uh, kind of uh, behavior is, is tracked. And the reason for this is that um, we were told by, by many individuals that loan officers who had engaged in what we'd say is bad behavior uh, previously, had been fired by their microfinance institutions and had gone and secured jobs in other MFIs. And so this is clearly very concerning if individuals who had behaved badly are suddenly moving on to another MFI and taking up another a senior role there. And so um, this potential for, for a staff information bureau with consumer protection in mind is, is something that, that, that came out of the interviews. Um, and uh, it's especially important because of the, the, the kind of very close relationship that the loan officers do have with their, with their clients. And this leads me uh, nicely to the final point on this relationship. Um, this relationship is still uh, very much a face-to-face -face relationship for many for many MFIs, um, especially the NBFCs. 
um, and, and many, many are still quite uh, reliant on these face-to-face -face transactions, and they were quite reluctant to, to fully transition to digital communications and digital payment methods during the crisis. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of nice uh, work out there at the moment talking about how this crisis can be a potential to accelerate this move to digital financial services. And of course, we agree and uh, we think there's a lot of uh, potential here. But um, uh, during this crisis, many MFIs had expressed to us a reluctance to, to transition because of um, lack of understanding from customers, lack of sophistication in the phones that they were using. Um, so so uh, it, they didn't think it was appropriate for many of their clients. Um, but also there was a potential for miscommunication. They were, they were worried that if they would send uh, messages to people um, about a deferring of loan, that they would somehow interpret that as, as, as the MFI, um, possibly going bankrupt, et cetera. And we had heard of people spreading some rumors on WhatsApp and of the like of, of certain MFIs closing down and things like this. So, so this was a concern that many MFIs had. Um, and so it's again something that needs to be looked at in terms of this transition to, to digital financial services, understanding from consumer perspective what are the what are the challenges here. And again, the Pakistan Microfinance Network has conducted uh, research recently to find out uh, about this potential transition to digital during the crisis. And 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 they found that over half of people really said that they do not want to move to digital. And and it's very important for us to really try and understand why is it that over half of respondents in this survey or why is there generally such a reluctance to move to to, to digital um, and financial services, especially among the poorer clients of, of NBFCs. Um, so um, I think I will uh, leave it there and I'll move on to Farah. Mohammed, um, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, I'll build on what Mohammed just discussed and summarize some of the key policy response in Pakistan to the crisis. Um, so Pakistan was relatively quick to lock down. Soon after the first death was reported in March, the entire country was essentially put under a lockdown that continued for another one and a half months. Um, and the State Bank of Pakistan and the Security and Exchange Commission of Pakistan were quick to announce a series of regulations that were designed to dampen the effect of the pandemic. I grouped them here in largely three main facilities, although there were others um, that uh, smaller facilities that were designed to also facilitate borrowers. The first, which was introduced early in March, was aimed at facilitating banks and non-banking financial institutions in rescheduling the loans of their borrowers as a result of COVID-19. Specifically, the policy permits all MFIs to defer the repayment of loan principal amount for one year upon written request from the borrower up until uh, 30 June 2020. Later on, this written request was also relaxed, and so now borrowers can send in their request using SMS, email, or phone. In principle, this means a meaningful relaxation for the borrowers, since deferring for 12 months means shifting the entire payment schedule by 12 months. It doesn't mean that you will load all the deferred payments into a shorter time frame or require heavier repayment uh, periods afterwards. Um, and this also meant that there would be no adverse effects on the credit rating of the borrower. In fact, if um, a borrower was not given this uh, facility. For example, let's suppose a borrower was uh, sent in this request and this was not approved by the bank or the microfinance institute, then they had to provide a reason for this to the state bank. So this is a very clear signal by the regulators that you should be facilitating your borrowers. In addition, in March, as I mentioned, there were some smaller facilities. For example, the central authorities allowed other relaxations for online transactions and recommended that financial providers in general should start thinking about ways of promoting digital financial services without requiring them to do anything specific at the time. The second of these regulations came in April. This is right when we were conducting our surveys. Um, and this was designed to assist small and medium-sized businesses retain their workforce. Now, not necessarily the microfinance sector, but a lot of these SMEs are actually financed by uh, microfinance banks. So the federal government, uh, announced a refinance scheme that would allow SMEs to borrow from commercial and microfinance banks for financing their wage bills. Uh, this facility was only available to SMEs and not to microenterprises that typically have very few, if any, full-time employees. And note that there is no equivalent of this policy for non-enterprise borrowers of microfinance who, uh, just in terms of numbers, form the majority of microfinance clientele. Um, and are also likely to be from lower income households and more vulnerable than the SME owners. By May 2020, an estimated 37 billion rupees had been deferred or restructured under the first scheme, um, according to the SCCP. Um, and by mid-June, nearly 800,000 clients of MFIs had availed this facility. 
An additional 1,700 businesses had applied for the refinance loan under the Employee Support Program. Um, and so press releases by both SECP and, and the State Bank at this point seem to imply, uh, imply both high demand um, and high utility of both facilities. The third major initiative came in May. This is after our paper was published, so this is more recent. Um, and this was in recognition of the higher risk associated with the refinance scheme loans that the banks will be undertaking. So the Ministry of Finance announced a credit sharing facility on loans given to SMEs, undertaking to bear 40% of the first lo loss to banks um, on loans given to these borrowers. So this is, uh, this is exactly what uh, Mohammed was talking about earlier, where this was actually meant for you know, the CEOs that we interviewed were saying this should be more broadly uh, offered. But for now, this is available to people who are lending to SMEs. Um, a similar facility for microfinance institutes uh, and non-banking institutes who may face clients wanting to defer their loans uh, and will likely be also facing riskier borrowers and subsequent loans in the future has not been introduced yet, or at least this development is not yet public knowledge. In the last month, deadlines related to both the refinance and loan deferment schemes have been extended for another three months. Um, and while the regulatory framework allows for loans to be deferred and some additional protections for SME, it is unclear whether this is sufficient for a large proportion of the microfinance borrowers. Both the survey conducted by a Pakistan microfinance network that Mohammed mentioned and our own recent uh, data has shown that awareness of this restructuring or deferment option is still very low. So the, though the national lockdown has been eased um, in May, the, recently the government has announced that it will be employ, employing a smart lockdown strategy. Um, they will identify COVID hotspots with high infection rates and low compliance with social distancing measures um, that will need to go back into lockdown immediately for the next 10 to 15, 14 days until the situation is more under control. And so in mid-June, they had identified 500 such spots which were put back under lockdown with strict restrictions on movement and on timings and operations of all businesses. Um, other than pharmacies and grocery stores. As a result, as Mohammed also explained, it is quite clear from the recent service conducted by PMN that the trends that we capture early on in our survey of uh, massive reduction in income and economic activity continues to date because of real or expected disruption in both demand and supply channels. We see this in other survey data that we have been collecting as well, which I'll just briefly mention. So in a survey conducted in collaboration with Hamna Ahmed, Mehreen Mehmood, and Zunia Tirmizi, with nearly 1,300 households in urban Lahore between April and June, we find that a very high proportion of households, in fact, almost two-thirds of the sample reported that the primary earner in the household had stopped working. And this was only less likely to happen if the main earner was a salaried government employee. In another survey that is currently underway and is joint work with uh, Giovanna Diada, Mehreen Mehmood, and Diego Upul, we interview female owners of microenterprises who had received microfinance loans for their business. We find that almost one out of every 10 women that we interview, uh, have interviewed to date, report that their businesses have completely shut down due to the lockdown. Uh, but they do hope to reopen their businesses in the, in the near future. They don't know when this will be. These business owners don't have a lot of savings to rely on. Nearly 95% of the sample reported that their household earnings will only last about a month. And so even in more recent surveys, we see that the dramatic reductions in household and business incomes persist. Uh, further, most microfinance borrowers are not typically eligible for the cash assistance given under uh, uh, the COVID relief programs in Pakistan. Only a hundred, about 100 out of the 1,300 female business owners that we interviewed ha reported having received any cash or food assistance from the government. They are generally not eligible under the SRS program that the government um, has rolled out. In the paper, we put forward a series of recommendations that uh, Mohammed has just summarized. And though the regulatory framework in Pakistan was quick to address the need for some of them, there are three potential areas that our interviews revealed remain a point of concern. One is the credit trading facility that has been extended for SME loans, which should be extended more broadly to the rest of the sector to encourage lending, as according to the CEOs that we interviewed. As the participants in our survey also noted, it is unclear whether borrowers will be uh, ever be able to pay these loans back. And so as demand for these services are expected to increase in the future, the sector really needs to be equipped uh, to deal with higher risk associated with newer loans. And then just to summarize again what Mohammed has already stated, while regulations for consumer protections do exist, uh, this, the, depth of this, the depth of this shock implies that regulators have to protect uh, the poorer households from uh, exploitation by loan providers in general and loan officers also specifically. 
finally, the industry needs to start thinking seriously about alternate channels. There have been some indications from the regulators that this would be recommended, but as I said, there's nothing so far that requires them to switch uh, more to digital financial services. And at the moment, very few MFIs and even fewer clients are positioned to transition to digital transactions from face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. Okay, so I will stop here and um, I'm happy to take questions and comments later. Tim? Thanks, Farah. Um, okay, I want to wrap us up here, sort of drawing together some of these threads and then we'll open it up to, to start discussing questions. Um, and you know, some thoughts on, on what uh, this crisis means for the industry and these results mean for how we should think about the industry as a whole. Uh, and I want to start with uh, you know, our next steps, I think, need to be grounded in a rethinking of the purposes of microcredit and microfinance. Uh, you know, we are far from the first uh, to point out the, the gap between the standard microcredit product and the rhetoric of microcredit as an investment loan. Um, the, you know, this structure that has made microfinance, microcredit successful of, uh, of regularity, of consistency, of, uh, you know, immediate repayment on, on weekly schedules um, has shown itself to be very, very valuable to clients, but is not very compatible uh, with significant investment. What it is compatible with is an understanding uh, that we've gained from household surveys like Portfolios of the Poor and other financial diaries and other work is that uh, these households struggle to manage liquidity. They struggle to uh, create lump sums when they need them. Uh, they borrow sometimes to create those lump sums. They save, they, they struggle to match the ups and downs of their cash flows to their actual needs. And that microcredit has served a very important role in helping these households uh, manage liquidity. And that is its primary role in the, the lives of many, many borrowers. It helps explain some of the results from uh, microcredit impact evaluations. That being said, that doesn't minimize the importance of the product. A liquidity management product is crucial to households who have uh, difficulty with volatility. In fact, it's crucial to most financial purposes. If we think about uh, the immediate reactions of central bank authorities in, uh, in wealthy nations to, uh, to the COVID crisis, the very first thing the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank did was to backstop liquidity facilities. They backstop liquidity facilities because they are absolutely crucial to the functioning of local economies. When uh, institutions, organizations, households come to depend on a source of liquidity, it shapes all of their other choices. And if that liquidity drains very quickly, it can have deep, deep consequences. And I think that's already what we were seeing in Pakistan. And it's the way we should be thinking about the impact of uh, of a lack of access to microcredit, of, of, uh, of a closing up of the sector. That liquidity, uh, even if, if the, we move away from the rhetoric of microfinance as spurring investment, its role in helping households manage liquidity is crucial and deserves uh, the attention and importance and support uh, that goes along with that for other liquidity management facilities. Second, and, and Mohammed was referencing some of this, this idea of the regulatory structure for microfinance uh, we have to be paying deep attention to, both because of uh, understanding the importance of liquidity management, <clears throat> but also because of the various ways that microfinance institutions touch customers' lives and the, the possible harm uh, that can be done with the withdrawal of these facilities or of uh, the bad behavior of the MFIs themselves or, or of rogue loan officers. Uh, these are really important things that deserve more attention. We had a brief flash of attention to them uh, in the wake of the Andhra Pradesh crisis, uh, but it, it it, it should be coming back to the forefront of our attention now and thinking about what that regulatory trade-off is, what are the right regulatory structures to protect households who uh, are making use of this important liquidity management facility that microcredit and microfinance is providing to them. Um, <clears throat> of course, part of the microfinance business model has been built on low touch regulation, uh, which you can also think of as low cost regulation. So part of the argument uh, that the MFI industry has made is that they don't need to comply uh, with lots of the regulations that apply to formal banks uh, because the risk and the danger to their customers is much less than uh, the systemic risk that goes along with and the consumer protection risk that goes along with, say, de deposit taking. And, and we're, we're seeing that that's probably not true. 
and therefore uh, more prudential regulation is useful, but we also have to wrestle with the fact that that it drives up the cost of serving low income and poor customers. And therefore that's going to affect the profitability and the sustainability of MFIs and thinking through these issues of uh, the business model. Where is the capital going to come from? At what cost is the capital going to be? Uh, we should also expect many global capital providers to revise their estimates of the risk of providing <clears throat> excuse me, of providing uh, capital to MFIs, which has uh, largely been seen as risk-free, and, and rightly so. It has largely been risk-free uh, uh, prior to the COVID crisis. Uh, that's not going to continue, and that's going to affect the cost of capital for MFIs around the world. Uh, and that then has uh, uh, knock-on effects for what the cost of, uh, of serving uh, or the profitability of serving low-income customers is. Now, uh, one of the things that came up in the survey and one of the things that questions that came up in the chat was this question about digital financial services and a transition to digital financial services. Uh, I recently hosted a, a web on this topic that you can find in the Financial Access Initiative, a recording of that um, webinar on the Financial Access Initiative website, uh, you know, talking about the digital financial services and this transition in the light of COVID. Uh, and just a, a couple of key points that I want to make here that uh, gets glossed over often, I feel, in many of these conversations is that while the cost of a, the marginal digital finance transaction is negligible. The cost of providing digital financial services is, is quite high. It is incredibly capital intensive, both uh, the technology capital, but also human capital of people who know how to manage digital finance. Um, and it requires a very large ongoing investment. It's not like a, a one-time investment. If you're going to offer digital financial services, you have to continue to invest in advancing that technology and protecting that technology uh, and, and have the, the human and financial uh, capital sources to do that. Uh, most MFIs just don't have access to the kind of capital necessary to make the digital finance transition, uh, particularly because uh, they can't force their clients to make that transition. They are serving many clients who are not ready to make the transition to digital. And so that means for MFIs that they have to, if they want to make a digital finance transition, they have to make it as an additional channel. So they can't replace the costs of physical. They're going to have to maintain those uh, physical channels and the costs that go with them, as well as offering this new other very expensive, very difficult to manage channel. And so the digital financial uh, services challenge for NFIs is quite significant and comes along uh, with a, a great deal of questions from both a funding, from the funding side, from the sustainability side, and from the regulatory side. Uh, and we need to take that seriously while uh, digital native uh, if you know, fintechs um, have the possibility of taking uh, many of the most profitable customers from MFIs. So MFIs are caught in this bind where if they don't go digital, they may lose their most profitable customers. Uh, if they do go digital, it's going to raise their costs and make it more difficult to serve some of their poorest customers. Um, you know, that is not uh, a challenge that I envy taking on. And as an industry, uh, you know, as a, observers of these industries, as investors in that industry, uh, we need to take those things seriously and not just look at digital financial services as a panacea. And then finally, to close this out, uh, I'd like to make sure that we keep our attention focused on preserving the modern microfinance movement's most important assets. Knowledge, serving these customers is hard. We've developed incredible knowledge on how to, to provide these services in a sustainable way that's, uh, uh, that's positive for the customers and has reached incredible scale. But uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, the modern microfinance movement is not the first to have figured this out. And that knowledge was lost from earlier iterations of things like my, microfinance when collapses came. Uh, and it set back the cause of financial inclusion often for decades, if not centuries. So preserving the knowledge that we've gained and preserving the trust in these institutions that in many contexts are uh, you know, one of the few rules-based reliable institutions that low-income customers deal with on a frequent basis Preserving those is, should be a, a priority for regulators uh, and um, aid agencies and DFIs and multilaterals. Uh, that uh, the, you know, the foundation that we have built to be able to offer financial services to hundreds of millions of low-income customers is in danger and needs to be shored up. Um, and uh, that is going to require concerted attention and investment uh, from, from, uh, from the historical investors in the microfinance movement. Um, I'd like to draw your attention. We've closed the poll. Uh, you can see that, I think, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, I see uh, that 
you know, we are seeing patterns similar to what we're seeing in the um, uh, in the CGAP Pulse Survey and noting that the majority of respondents are either um, uh, similarly worried as they were 60 days ago or more worried. Um, and that it sort of tracks with you know, what I am hearing in my conversations. Uh, on that note, I'm going to open the floor. I, I think maybe Rebecca, are you going to uh, be managing the Q&A? Yes, thank you very much, Tim. Um, and, and thanks also to Mohammed and to, to Farah. Um, we have a few questions, and, and, and Tim, you know, you hit the nail on the head with the, the DFS questions. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, of questions here related to um, that response, that reluctance to, um, to, to use uh, DFS solutions. So thanks for, for your comments there. I'd love to, you know, hear any reactions as well from Mohammed Afar uh, about digital finance and kind of what the future looks like there, what regulators might be able to do or investors. Um, I'll, I'll read out maybe a three themes of questions that I'm seeing, and then I'll, I'll let you guys kind of respond. Um, the first is around um, the heterogeneity of microfinance institutions, and also um, if there's any trends, you know, from institution to institution or types of institutions, and then also urban versus rural, if we see anything there. Um, a second theme of questions is around um, the um, impact on women. Um, and, and looking at, at some of this gender disaggregated data, um, wondering if um, speakers could, could say a little bit more about um, you know, gender specific barriers to navigating this crisis, to accessing resources and services, and um, uh, maybe gendered impact on um, women owned businesses, you know, the types of businesses that um, women tend to, to work in, and things like that. Um, and then, there was another question, and this last one I'll, I'll say for now, about um, impact on, on uh, multiple borrowers. Um, so let me pause there and see you know, if anybody wants to react to any of these initial themes of questions. Um, thanks, Rebecca. I can start with a couple. Um, so the, uh, there were a couple of questions about this uh, report from the Pakistan Microfinance uh, Network. Um, and, and generally about the finding that they had of uh, greater than 50% of, of people who they had surveyed uh, had didn't want to move uh, digital. Unfortunately, I, in the in the webinar that we had, uh, there wasn't any further detail on the reasons why they were reluctant to uh, move to digital. But I agree that that's a really uh, interesting question, and I believe that they're currently in the process of writing um, up that report. So hopefully, uh, they'll be able to share um, some more details. Uh, soon. Um, in, in terms of uh, MFI heterogeneity behavior, again, uh, the data is not available yet, but I think it will be interesting. Um, Farah Far already mentioned uh, some, some preliminary data there. Um, it would be interesting to see by institution type how many, um, how many institutions had basically taken up this uh, deferral of, 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 of loans. Um, with their borrowers and basically like how many borrowers had used this facility that's been provided to them by the, the SECP um, and the state bank. Um, but they, I'm not aware of that data um, uh, appearing yet, but I think it probably will um, at some point in the future. Um, urban versus rural, far I can probably uh, talk more about that, but when we were doing the interviews at the time, uh, many uh, of the CEOs were really emphasizing to us the fact that the even though urban micro enterprises had uh, really suffered and were suffering and, and experienced a complete kind of collapse in demand in their businesses, um, many uh, urban, especially agricultural um, businesses were still um, facing uh, harvest and, and profitable opportunities. And so, you know, there was a desire there to lend to uh, specific sectors that um, are still profitable, still have profitable opportunities and, and maybe have a quick bounce back. Um, but of course, everything that Tim mentioned about the pressure that, that the MFIs are facing on their own um, on their own sources of funding uh, implies that uh, many are reluctant to even lend to um, sectors that, that that are potentially quite uh, profitable. Um, and on that point, uh, many had mentioned to us um, that uh, you know a credit guarantee program is, is something that would uh, make them feel more at ease in terms of of lending. Um, so I, I'll leave it to Farah to uh, address, and then uh, we don't have anything on multiple borrowing, unfortunately. Um, but I agree that that's, uh, that's also an interesting uh, point. Uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of anything um, in our Pakistan data set that tells us anything about multiple borrowing. 
Mohammed. So I'll, I'll try to answer all three questions using both uh, uh, gendered perspective and also something on urban and rural. So gender is, I think, um, not only for Pakistan, but for most sectors uh, all over the world, uh, microfinance sectors, uh, borrowers, um, female borrowers are both important, but also face more constraints and more different kinds of uh, barriers to their participation. And here I would um, ask you to think not just about the clients, but also loan officers. So what we were, what we found in our survey is, is that uh, for amongst the businesses, um, businesses owned by women were, you know, about 8% more likely to experience a complete shutdown of their business. And this is our survey and also this is then verified. We see similar kind of trends in the survey that we're doing right now with another sample of only women. And then our loan officers were even more, um, you know, constrained than the men because they had restrictions on their mobility, additional restrictions on mobility, public transport was not available, and then a lot of them had to ask their husbands or their or their brothers to drop them to a client's home, and then that would interrupt, obviously, the husband's um, job as well. And so they were restricted on both sides. And so a female borrower um, might not feel very comfortable if they're used to with a particular loan officer if she can't come in. That has a different kind of implication for long-term kind of relationship that uh, it, it really disrupts the kind of relationship they've been building over time. So both from the loan officer and the borrower perspective, that was important. Um, they also fa face a lot more restrictions when it comes to, let's suppose, just managing the business. So um, they were even more restricted within the household. Um, if the supply was disrupted in general, their supply was disrupted even more. And so they couldn't go to, the, they couldn't go to their clients, for example, and sell their uh, whatever product they were making. And that meant that a lot more businesses owned by women were closing down. Um, and this also kind of explains the uh, reluctance we see in the digital financial services on the side of the clients. So a lot of the women, um, this is based on another survey done by Kush Foundation, which lends only to women. And they found that almost about one third of the sample um, has their own same. So a lot of the women, about two thirds of their entire uh, borrowing sample, does not they don't have their own sim which means they're sharing their phones with their husbands or or their you know some of them uh, some other member of the family and that really means it's difficult for them to then manage a mobile wallet or payments on on that product or receive payments etc um, and a lot of time they have to then rely on the agent or or someone else to operate that for them um, and even fewer women than men in our surveys in the qualitative data that we did focus group discussions and and, and others after our survey uh, women were generally more reluctant for that reason is, is because they, it, it increases their dependency on another person in between. Um, and so this gender perspective is very important in that sense. And I'm glad someone asked this question because uh, we didn't get the chance to talk about this in the middle. Um, in terms of urban versus rural, again, uh, our sample was, uh, you know, the survey that we did was both urban and rural. And a lot of the microfinance organizations in Pakistan concentrate on um, rural basically and what we found there was that clients were a little more reassured about at least one of the biggest uh, stresses they had was about availability of food and they were reassured there um, but urban clients had this additional uh, stress about not having enough food not having enough public transport um, and so some of the constraints that we saw although we don't really um, differentiate the results and we don't look at heterogeneity by urban and rural but from what we remember from the service, because we conducted a lot of these surveys ourselves also, um, is that clients in urban areas are facing greater issues. Um, and so um, the erosion of trust that Tim also talked about later, it seemed to be happening more in urban areas because there was this complete barrier in what the, what the border expected and what the loan officer or the microfinance organization was or could communicating. Um, and I think I'll stop here and, and um, yeah. So, uh, Rubik, I'm going to leap in, too. There have been a couple of questions about, uh, you know, what is the persistence and what should the funding strategies uh, for NFIs be? And just offer a, a couple of, of comments there. So, one of the big questions that we have uh, that we don't have an answer to but are concerned about is um, most of the um, – a lot of the action has been in the idea of deferring repayment of existing loans. Uh, and that, you know, obviously is helpful to the households who don't have to pay, but has some impact on the cash flow of the MFIs themselves. At some point that deferment ends and depends on the idea that after however long has passed, that these households will suddenly return 
to their prior levels of income in order to repay those loans. And uh, it's uh, unclear in a lot of places uh, whether that deferment is at zero interest or uh, interest is accumulating on the loans and how MFIs are going to expect to be repaid. Uh, you know, obviously from the MFIs perspective, uh, the cost of, of not taking payment isn't just the, co the cash foreborn in the present, it's but the ongoing value of that cash. And so there are very real questions about even when things reopen and restart, um, can the borrowers ever repay uh, their loans uh, over what period of time? And if the, the cash flow of the MFIs is uh, substantially uh, undermined by the fact that their customers can't repay at the levels that they, they had in the past and are not going to take out new loans uh, that generates additional cash flow for the MFIs uh, until they repay their current loans, uh, we can see a sort of a permanent and declining equilibrium for uh, the MFIs uh, as their customers can't ramp up their businesses because they can't get access to new loans. Uh, the MFIs can't refund themselves because their cash flow is depressed, so they are more reluctant to lend. And we were back in the bind that the modern microfinance movement started to solve of how do we get the capital available. Now, uh, the way around that has ultimately to do with the sources of capital that MFIs have tapped around the world. And the big question that still remains is, uh, what are the development finance institutions going to do to support the microfinance sector that they have played such a, a role in bringing to scale? And so far, we're just not seeing very much public action, at least from the DFIs, who seem to be sitting on their hands, uh, waiting to see what happens. Uh, and uh, that can create uh, uh, many problems uh, around the world if, if that goes on too long. Uh, and you know, bailing out uh, an institution after it's in dire straits is almost always more expensive than uh, providing uh, support uh, uh, prior to that. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're we're coming up on the hour. Um, I see there's still um, there's a couple of remaining questions in the chat, but um, Abby, I think you know the the most important thing is that um, you can follow up with uh, with IPA and any of the speakers um, after, and we can send out obviously um, some of the resources that the speakers mentioned. That um, there's links. Um, that our colleagues have been providing in the chat um, to some of these uh, webinars and, and, and studies that the speakers have been mentioning. Um, now I just want to thank everyone um, again for, for your time and for your participation. I think this has been um, you know, quite a, a rich conversation, um, a, lot, uh, a lot to dig into here. Um, and you know, again, thank you everyone for uh, there we go. So thank you everyone for your time. Um, please do feel free to reach out um, to contact IPA at this email that you see on the screen, financial inclusion at povertyaction.com with any questions to the speakers that we can um, connect you to or you know, questions about this work or, or other work that, that's going on right now on the topic. Um, and then obviously for more resources on financial inclusion, please do visit findevgateway.org um, where there will be a copy of the recording for this webinar. Um, and um, you'll also receive it by email and related materials um, uh, as soon as it's ready. So thank you again. Um, you know, thank you, um, Mohammed, Tim, Farah. Thank you, Abby and Sindev Gateway, um, and to our colleagues at Innovations for Poverty Action. Um, have a wonderful day and a great evening. Great. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And I just wanted to mention that if everyone can respond to the poll on the right-hand side, um, that's uh, just a final evaluation to get your feedback on this webinar. Um, and as Rebecca mentioned, we will email everyone when the webinar recording and related materials are available on the FINDEV Gateway website. And as Rebecca mentioned, here's the email and to get in touch with IPA. And for more research, resources on financial inclusion, you can visit FINDEVGateway.org. Uh, thank you very much to everyone, to the speakers and all the participants for an engaging discussion. Thank you.